Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Are you there today? Yes. Am I here with you today? Yes. There's a new kind of love. There's a new kind of love flowing in your heart. Something more will happen. Love in your family. Love in the church. And that love will bring every good thing to your life in Jesus' name. Thank you, choir. There's a new kind of love that is flowing. I'm sorry I, I missed your crosses, but I can tell. Was it a good time, your crosses? I'll come back again to hear the crosses. Praise the Lord. I didn't know that, you know, your road was just like this to get here. But if you love somebody, if you love somebody, his house will not be too far. I want to say that I love you, I love every family, and I love your church. Even seeing your faces, nobody can, re can resist loving you. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now we'll be serious. Because Bible study time has come. Yeah. And those who are outside, are you there? Yeah. Let me see your face there. God bless every one of you. And today be an enriching time in the life of everyone in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. We thank you for the love of God in our hearts. Thank you because we were born of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And it is that love that brought us into the kingdom. And we pray that that love will keep us in the kingdom in Jesus' name. We pray that as we open the pages of the scriptures today, you will teach us. And you will let your love flow in every heart in Jesus' name. Sweep away every negative thing by your love. And establish us in this truth that this love will carry us on. That more grace will come to every life in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless everyone you can see them. We're coming to John, 1 John chapter 3. And as we look at 1 John chapter 3, you'll understand that the chapter starts by talking about the sons of God, the children of God. It says, behold, what manner of love. The Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. The chapter begins with the love of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. As you look at this chapter, that word love comes up a number of times. And as you look at the whole epistle itself, the epistle of 1 John has 26 times mentioning love and love and love. It mentions the now, the love of God. It mentions the verb that we need to love one another. And as you come to just this chapter 3 alone, and you look at the times that the word love appears, you will see that actually the center of the Christian life is love. The center of the, Christian, of the Christian message is love. And the center of the Christian administration, that is of, uh, you know, the church, we administer the church, we guide the church, we counsel the church, we help the church, we plan for the church, we strategize for the church, for the church to grow. The center of it all is love. I want you to just look at some verses in this chapter 3 alone. Look at verse 10. It says in verse 10, in this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil whosoever doeth righteousness and doeth not righteousness is not of God. Then it says neither he that loveth his brother. 
Come to verse 11. As we come to verse 11, it says, For this is the message that we heard from the beginning, that we shall love one another. It said, that's the message we heard from the beginning. And the message still continues. Because what you start with, born because of the love of God, coming into the kingdom of God on the basis of the love of God, we continue in that Christian experience and we continue in that family of God by that same love. I come to verse 14. It tells us in verse 14, still talking about love, it says, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. You see that? It says, if you're looking for evidence in any line, evidence in anybody that says, I'm a child of God, I've overcome the world and I've passed from judgment and I've come to justification. I'm saved. I'm redeemed. And my life is different. It says, look for one evidence there. We know that we are passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Is dead spiritually. Is dead morally, is dead to the future, is dead all around within and around. And it says, if he doesn't love his brother, you find a man, you find a woman that still abides in death. Look at verse 16. It says, Herein perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren lay down our lives for the brethren that is when well, you're willing to go to any extent to help your brother to protect your brother and to make sure that your brother has the very best of the christian life we're looking at verse 17 it says but who so has these world's goods and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion on him from him how dwelleth the love of god in him how dwelleth the love of God in him? You need to be asking yourself, if you see your brother, you see your sister, you see another child of God, and then you shut up your bowels of compassion, and there's no mercy, and there's no compassion, and there's no love. He's saying, how dwelleth the love of God in him? What evidence are you going to show that you belong to the Lord if there is no manifestation, demonstration of practical love? Look at verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Verse 23. In verse 23, it says, this is his commandment, that we should believe on the on the name of the son of his son jesus christ and love one another as he gave us commandment and so you see as we're looking at uh, these uh, verses 10 all through to verse 24 it's centered on the love of god and so the topic tonight is divine love in the transformed heart divine love in the transformed heart. Now you will see that those words there, number one, is love. And love, you, there are many kinds of love. And you sometimes read uh, the literature of the people of the world, and they talk about love and love and love. But that one is fleshly love. That one is a uh, kind of eros. That's the Greek. It's erotic. That one is, you know, I love you, you love me. That one is fleshly. There's another kind of love. It's a natural love from the mother to the child, from the child to the mother, from the children to the parents. That one is natural. That's natural love. And we ought to have that if we're, if we're you know, people that know that love is very important. You must love your children and your children must love you. And we must love one another as friends. But the love we're talking about here in this study is not not erotic love it is not fleshly love it is not even the natural love we're talking about divine love that's why it says the love of god how dwelleth the love of god in him divine love but you'll see it says in the heart in the heart this one is not coming from the head this not or this one is not coming from willpower you know just will something and you struggle and you try the man is not lovable, but I'll try. 
That lady is not lovable, but I'll try. She gets on my nerves every time, but I'll struggle, I'll try. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the one that is flowing from the heart. Because from the death of your heart, the Lord has touched your heart. You have tasted the love of God. And it is a transformed heart. A heart that has been touched and transformed by the love of God. And now divine love that is flowing from that transformed heart. The Lord will do more of it in your life. Amen. We're looking at this a study under three subtitles. Number one, the distinguishing mark of the of true sons of God. The distinguishing marks of true sons of God. How do we know children of God? How do we recognize children of God? How do we know the people who are born again? How do we know the people who are on their way to heaven? We're looking at the distinguishing mark. In the uh, true sons of God. Number two, the demonstrative model. Demonstrative model. A model we can look at that is perfect in love. A model we can look at that has no mixture of hatred with it. A model of love. Demonstrative love for transformed saints of God. For transformed saints of God, those who are transformed. And when the grace of God has come upon your life, and you can say, I'm converted, I'm transformed, I'm changed. Something has happened to me. Then we'll see. There's a model before you. It's a model of your Savior, the model of your Lord, and the model of Jesus Christ. And that's the model you're looking at. Everything, everything that takes place in your life, you're looking at that model, and you want to be like that, you'll be like Jesus. The demonstrative model for transformed saints of God. Number three, the devotional moments of trusting supplication before God. Devotional moments. The times we have to pray. There are times we just love to pray. There are times we are drawn to pray. And there are times we are driven to pray. And when we pray like that, there's something God is going to be looking at in our hearts, in our life. That we have that love and that connects us with God. And there's no condemnation in our hearts. And therefore, we're able to have answers to our prayers. God will answer your prayers. The devotional moments of trusting, supplication before God. Let's come to number one. What's number one over there? The distinguishing mark of the true sons of God. Let's come to let's come to First John chapter three. First John chapter three. I'm reading from verse eleven. It says, "For this is the message that she had from the beginning that." Ye, that we should love one another. Then immediately it comes to say in verse 12, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And wherefore, why, for what reason slew he is him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's works righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you, ye know that we have passed from death unto life. Because we love the brethren, he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother, listen to this, whosoever hateth his brother. I said, whosoever hateth his brother, tell me. Is a murderer. You know, there are people that, you know, they darken the doorstep of the church every time. They come in, they come in with hatred. And then they sit down there, they listen to everything you are saying, and the hatred is bottled up inside them. And then as they're going out, the hatred is still there. And it says, whosoever. And that's what whosoever means. The person may have a great office and a great title and a great stature. And the fellow is popular and well known, but he's a whosoever. Whosoever hateth his brother abideth in death because he is a murderer. And then it says, and ye know that no murderer 
has eternal life abiding in him. It says uh, hatred and eternal life cannot stay in the same place. It says uh, hatred and uh, the assurance of being a child of God cannot stay in the same place. And so whosoever, a man, a woman, a so-called brother, a so-called sister, whosoever hateth his brother, hateth his sister, is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Thank God I have, I have eternal life abiding in me. Somebody has said, I have eternal life abiding in me. Uh -huh. Hatred will have to go. Hatred will have to vanish from there. The distinguishing mark of the sons of God, the true sons of God. Let me first of all look at this verse 13. Oh, sorry. It says, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. That means the world, because they don't have salvation, the world, because they don't have eternal life, the world, because they are not born again, the world, because they do not know the Lord, that's why they have the hatred. And it says, Marvel not, those people of the world, they may go to church and they may prove confess that they know the Lord but because they do not have eternal life abiding in them that's why they have that hatred and then he's telling us I'm coming to verse 12 he said not as Cain he's talking about love and then he says not as Cain what's the matter with Cain the matter with Cain is that his works were evil his sacrifice was not acceptable he didn't have the sacrifice that has the blood of the lamb in it and therefore he was rejected but his brother abel had the blood sacrifice and the brother abel was accepted he was righteous counted righteous in the sight of the lord and then this man his brother cain hated him envy jealousy because his brother was accepted and he was not accepted, therefore he hated him. And that's why he's saying, not as Cain. But I still want to understand why is John, John is talking about love. And then John is saying, the love we're talking about is not as Cain. And let me show you what it means by this. You see this Cain, he hid his real intention. He hid the hatred that he had. Have you known some people, they, can, they may look friendly, and they may look nice, and they may look, uh, you know, gentle, and they may look welcoming. It's like, that's my friend, that's my friend, because they know how to cleverly hide the hatred they have in their hearts. They can smile with the hatred inside, and then they can shake your hands with hatred inside. They can even embrace you like this with hatred inside. That's why John is saying, I'm talking about love. I'm talking about the divine love of God in the heart. We're not talking about this superficial thing. We're not talking about what somebody is hiding in the heart. And the hatred is there. And then you can smile. And then before he brings the dagger out and cuts you down, you say, what? So and so. How could he do that? He was just smiling to me at that place. He was just embracing me at that time. That's why he's saying, John is telling us not as Cain. I'm looking at Proverbs chapter 10. And we're looking at verse 18. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 10. And we're reading from verse 18. It says, he that hideth hatred with lying lips. You see that? That's what Cain did. He was talking comfortably and friendly to Abel. And Abel did not have any suspicion at all that this man was going to do anything evil. He hid the envy, he hid the jealousy, and he hid the hatred so very well that uh, Abel could not suspect anything. He that hideth hatred with lying leaves, and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. I will not be a fool. Because you see, at the, at the end, everything will be discovered that it wasn't genuine. That the love he was proclaiming, he was uh, professing, was not uh, genuine. And uh, that's why the man of God said, we're talking about love, not as Cain. We can broaden that a little bit. We can say, we're talking about love, not as Balaam. You remember Balaam, he loved the wages of unrighteousness. 
See the prophecies of Balaam. And you will think that Balaam was a friend of the nation of Israel. Because he said, I see the star. And I see that a king is coming. He says, let me die the death of the righteous. This is a friend of the nation of Israel. Uh-uh, not a friend. He went behind and counseled Balak. To make all those men in Israel commit wardom and adultery. And then God destroyed many of them because of that. And we're talking about love, not as Cain. We're talking about love, not as Balaam. We're talking about love, we can say, not like Demas. Not like Demas. You see, Demas, look at this man. You'll think he has love. Uh -uh. He, has, he loves the world. And so he goes to the people of the world. He embraces them. He shakes hands with them. He laughs with them. He rejoices with them. And the people of the world think, look at this man. He's a man of love. But he has forsaken the gospel. He has forsaken salvation. And he never told those people the word of life that will bring them to eternal life. He just wanted something out of the world. We're talking about love, not as Cain. We're talking about love, not as Balaam. We're talking about love, not as demons. We're talking about love, not as Amnon. Amnon. You know, Amnon was one of the sons of David. And David had many sons and many daughters. One of them, the name was Tamar. And then somebody looked at Amnon and said, what's happening to you? Because you are the son of a king and you are growing lean and lean every day. He says, I love Tamar. I love Taman. And because I don't have opportunity to express my love, that's why I'm going lean and lean every day. Not as Amnon. And eventually, he pretended he was sick. Do, have you read that story before? Who has read that story before? Okay, you know the Bible. So you know the Bible. I like to preach to people like that because they know what I'm talking about. And then he feigned, he was pretending he was sick. And then David, the father, came and saw him. Oh, you're sick. He said, yes, I need food. And the kind of food I need, only Tamar can prepare that food and then I'll be all right. And David never knew anything. And then David said, Tamar, your brother needs your attention. He loves you so much. And then he wants you to prepare the food. But eventually, you know the story, he, defied, he raped Tamar. And then drove her out. And Timon said, what is this? Even the hatred you manifest now is greater than that other one you call love. We're talking about love, but not as Amnon. We're talking about love, but we're not talking of uh, love like agents. You see, there are agents. And agents are people that uh, they are serving somebody else. They are working for somebody else. And they come like agents. And then they talk to you. Agents are salesmen or saleswomen. And they know the language of salesmen and salesmanship. And then they talk to you. They are very nice. They want to sell something to you. But sometimes they want to sell you to somebody. And uh, that was, uh, and, and Samson did not realize that this woman was an agent, an agent of the Philistines. Those Philistines were waiting at the back of the door there. And then I love you, I love you, I love you. You know that kind of love. We we'll see that on the billboard and we we'll hear that over the, you know, all these people. I love, I love, I love. But it's the love of an agent. They want to kill your soul. Nobody will kill my soul. Uh, they want to drag you out. You know, that man had power, something. And the Philistines, they said, we will give you any price if you are an agent and we can get that power. We can suck that power out of something. And then, you know, something was playing the trick and all that. You cannot play with an agent. If you don't buy that thing the first day, agent, the agent will come back again. If you don't buy it the first week, the agent will come back again. The only way you can defeat that agent is say, please, I'm not interested in this deal. Go your way. Go and sell your commodity to another person. And eventually, the agent said, you say you love me. And I think you love me. And I love you so much. I love you to the point I want to kill you. But he didn't know. And so tell me now if you really love me. And then he vexed him. That's what the Bible says. Until he opened up and said, really, this is the matter. He sold himself. You will not sell your soul. 
you'll not sell your inheritance. You'll not sell your salvation. You will not sell your birthright. Immediately, that agent said, come. I will send him to you. Give me my money. They gave her her money. And then, he said, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. Look at this agent. And then Samson woke up after you sold the power. You've sold the birthright. You've sold everything you've got. Waking up matters not. He shook himself. That thing will not work. The agent has got him. And then they got him. And he pulled out all his, his two eyes. His power was gone. Strength was gone. And he told him to be grinding for them. And making entertainment for them. I will not be an entertainment for idol worshippers. I will not be. I will not be an entertainment for idol worshippers. We're, we're talking about love. We're talking about love. Not the love of an agent. We're talking about the love of Christ in you. When you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you are born by that love. And because you are born by that love, then that love will flow through you a new kind of love. I said a new kind of love. It will be your family in Jesus' name. Let, let's, come, let's come to you. Let's come to verse 11. In verse 11 it says, For this is the message that she heard from the beginning, that we shall love one another. Brothers and sisters, this is the message that she heard from the beginning, that we shall love one another. If there is any identifying mark, that we ought to look at in the life of a brother, in the life of a sister, and say, that's my brother, that's my sister. It is this love. Now understand, understand, we had this from the beginning. And when John was writing, many years had passed. You see, between the time, Jesus said, this is my commandment to you, that ye love one another. Many things had happened. And many persecutions had come. And yet, in the midst of those persecutions, the word of God is what we had from the beginning. At the time we had it at the beginning, no persecution. Jesus Christ was with them. He gathered them together. And he said, children, love one another. You see what I've done to you. Go and do the same to other people. I am with you now. And because Jesus was with them, no persecution. Everything was all right. Healing was there. Deliverances were there. Provisions were there. And now Jesus went away. After he went away, then the day of Pentecost came, they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. And persecution began. You know the story, Acts chapter 4, persecution. Acts chapter 5, persecution. Acts chapter 7, persecution. Acts chapter 8, persecution. And now at the end of all those persecutions, you know sometimes persecution can harden us. Problems can harden us. Sickness sometimes can harden us. You come out of that problem, you come out of the persecution, then you forget this is the message we heard from the beginning. That whatever is happening, rain or sunshine, disappointment or joy, whatever it is, that we love one another. We will forget the past. And then we will keep on loving one another. And because that's what it says, that's why it says now we're coming to First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. And I'm reading here now from verse 13. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. Stop there for a moment. You know, as we meet our brothers and sisters in the church, you don't know where we're coming from. You don't know what our relatives are saying about us. You don't know the slander that some of our brethren are encountering in the places they're coming from because the world hates them. Some of their relatives hate them. Some of their co-workers hate them because they will not do that which is evil. When they come to the church, that's where they can have comfort. That's where they can have encouragement. That's where they can have the demonstration, the manifestation of love. They must not experience the same pressure they experience in the world and the same heat they experience in the world. And so whatever has happened to you, understand, you don't know what that brother is going through, what that sister is going through in the world because the world hates us. 
And so when we come to the church, that's the time to have the oil of grace and the oil of love that will neutralize everything we have gone through in the world in Jesus' name. And then it says, uh, but there may be some people in the church that do not understand the message of love. Do you know there are some people that think that if you smile, you're losing your holiness so deliberately, so as to be holy. I don't know about that kind of holiness, but so as to be holy, they practice how to frown. They practice how to squeeze their faces so that when you see them say, brother, I'm summoning not the courage to ask you a question. Please, don't be offended. Why are you always frowning? You never smile. Oh, he says, you didn't understand. A Christian who wants to go to heaven must be sober, serious. And when you look at his face, you know that this one is going to heaven. So when you get to heaven, no smile, no laughter, no joy, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Tell me the next thing there. Joy. And if there's joy there, we'll see it on your face. Joy in the heart will beam out in the face. So ease up a little. We, we should not be frivolous, but we should be loving. We should be joyful. We should be happy. And we should know, look at a child of God. I want to be as happy as him. I want to be as joyful as her. That's the real Christian faith we're talking about. And then John said, it's from the beginning. We had this from the beginning. Let me show you what Jesus said that John is referring to from the beginning. We're looking at John, gospel according to St. John. The gospel according to St. John, we're reading from verse 13. Gospel according to St. John chapter 13, and we're reading from verse, 30, from verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye shall love one another. A new commandment I give unto you. Tell me out loud. Thank you very much. You understand? He was talking to his own disciples. Those disciples, they were not all of the same temperament. They were not all of the same outward expression. Look at Peter. He is the one that is always talking. Look at John. He is a more quiet fellow. And look at Matthew. He is an accountant. He is always calculating. And look at Andrew. He is always, you know, he leaves everybody. He goes out there. I've seen a boy here that has uh, the lunch and brings him. They have different characteristics. You know, we're not the same in our temperament. We're not the same in the way we carry ourselves. But Jesus said, or do you have different characteristics? and you have different temperaments and you have different ways of expressing yourself we may not even be of the of the same language you know we have uh, from people from the south there from the west over there from the east over there from the north over there he said whatever tribe whatever temperament wherever you are coming from this is my message to you that tell me that you love one another. The way women carry themselves is different from the way men carry themselves. And yet it says, although the differences are there between the men and the women, this is my message to you, my commandment to you, that she love one another. Look at these uh, young people, you know, the way they handle telephone and iPad and computer and all that. It's different from the way we adults handle this and that. It says all the same. If we're children of God, whatever the differences between us, this is my message unto you, my commandment unto you, that she love one another. You know, as you find us, those of us who are here, some of us are working in the office, some of us are working in the kitchen, some of us are working on the field, some of us are working in a company, some of us are, you know, in different, different places. When we come together like this, let's forget all those differences. And it says, my commandment to you, you are coming from this background. I'm coming from this background. My commandment to you is that you love one another. Look at that verse 34. It says in that verse 34, as I have loved you. That's the difference. That's the difference. You know, before this time, 
you find love in uh, the Old Testament. But Jesus Christ came to demonstrate the perfection of love. And he says, now, the way I want you to love each other is that you will love one another as I, Jesus Christ, your Savior, your Lord, as I have loved you, that she also love one another. Look at verse 35. By this, by this, what is that? By this, what is that this? Love. By this love. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If, tell me, ye have love one to another. Uh, look up. You know, Christ will never command us to do what we cannot do. He, can, he will never tell us to do what we cannot do. How can you tell a little child? A little child may be of two. To carry this pulpit here. Say, come and carry this. You can't do that. Because you know that child cannot do it. So, when Jesus said, I'm giving you a new commandment. That you should love one another. Somebody says over there, that's my weakness. I can't do that. I can do all things. But when somebody offends me, I know myself. I cannot love that person. Are you telling me that Jesus commanded you to do what he knows you cannot do? You can do it. Yeah. And you will do it. Yeah. Because he has made a transformation in us and he made us new creatures. He said, I've done something in you. I've put salvation inside you. I've converted you. I've changed your heart. I've changed your life. And because of what I know I've done in you, that's why I'm giving you this commandment that you love one another. Let go and love. I said, let go and love. And love the way Jesus Christ loved. We're coming to point number two now. And that's the demonstrative model for transformed saints of God. We're coming to 1 John. And we're reading from chapter 3, verse 16. 1 John, chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 16. In verse 16 it says, Hereby perceive we the love of God. Hereby Hereby we recognize the love of God. Hereby we know the love of God. You know, somebody cannot say, hey, brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, announce to you, I have love, but my kind of love is invisible love. You cannot see. You cannot tell. And even though you see that, you know, sometimes I frown and sometimes I do like this and that, I still have love because my love is invisible. The word of God says no. Love is so practical. If it is there, we will see. I see it on you. And it will show forth more in Jesus' name. Hereby, perceive we the love of God because he, he laid down his life for us. It says that's love. He laid down his life for us. That's John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting law, everlasting life. You know what the people of the world do? Sometimes we say, you know, they tell us that why do you think we don't have love? Of course we have love. See, just last weekend we spent uh, two million naira and we provided feast for people and I'm asking them, who did you provide feast for? If the man is coming from the east, he calls Easterners. They come and eat. If the man is coming from the west, he calls all the people from the west and they come and eat. If the man is coming from the north, you know, he dresses like a northerner and then he calls all those northerners and they come to eat. But you know, the love of Jesus Christ was not only to call the people of the east or the west, of the north. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever. Whosoever. That's our love. That's why in the church of the living God, when we manifest the love of Christ, we're not thinking that one is from the west. That one is from the east. That one is from the north. That one is from the south. We express our love to everybody. Am I right? 
And so, we do not know about tribe. We do not know about, you know, sectionalism. We do not know about tribalism. We do not know about nepotism. All we know is, that's a child of God. I'm going to be like Christ and my love will flow to him and my love will flow to her. That's why it says, thereby we perceive the love of God that because he laid down his life for us and that now he says, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. You know, people don't understand that. Uh, when it says we lay down our lives for the brethren, what does our life mean? People tell us time is money. They tell us life is strength. They tell us because if there is life, I can get this, I can get this, I can get this. Because I have life, I have a house. Because I have life, I have some work. Because I have life and I have strength, I've got a profession. Because I have life, I have a car. If because I have life, I have time, I have resources, I have energy, that's how I get all these. What does it mean to lay down my life for the brethren? I'm coming to the Bible study. I know that person is coming to the Bible study. I even know her. And here I am, I am driving. And I'm, you know, maybe myself and my wife uh, inside uh, the car, and that person is still waiting, and it's She's, she waits there for a long time she's going to meet much of the Bible study and I could easily stop there and I say sister are you going to the Bible study? Yes I'm going to the Bible study. Why don't you come in? Because I'm laying down that car is part of what your life has produced. See they've driven out this person out of accommodation and uh, you have a boys quarter there and uh, you know you pack all these things. The things you pack that you can bring all those things out and pack in another place and this fellow because he took his time for Christ and because of taking his time that's why they're persecuting him or persecuting her and they drove her out and you know cast all her things out and she's saying I have this need I have this need and then we say okay we will pray yes I like your prayer but how is God going to answer the prayer God will use you to answer the prayer yeah. and that amen is not for Lagos Island yeah. uh -huh. God, God used you in Jesus name yeah. That's how we lay down our lives. Look at that a child. That child asked the question outside the scripture. And the child has said, I'm a Christian, I'm born again, I'm a child of God. I was in this uh, class, uh, you know, before I became born again. And when I got back home and, you know, I told my parents, now I'm going to follow Christ, I'm born again. Ah, you want to carry born again, born again into this uh, family here? Okay, let Jesus go and pay your school fees. And so last um, term or last uh, session, I didn't go to school because my parents said, except I deny Christ, I will not go to school again. And I said, I will not deny Christ. Okay, if you are not deny Christ, there you are. Let uh, church, let um, Jesus pay your school fees. And that child is there. If that child were your own child, you will find school fees because that's part of your life. You say, my life is for these, my children. The education I didn't have, they must have. Uh-huh. How about this boy now? How about this girl now? Time is going. Let somebody rise up and pay that school fees. That is laying our life down for the brethren. It's not, you know, you're not just going to stick your net out, cut my neck. Why do you want us to cut your neck? Because I want you to cut my neck to show the church that I love the church. Uh -uh. I don't need your neck. I need your money to pay the school fees. I don't need your neck. I need accommodation for this person that doesn't have accommodation. This person that doesn't have clothing. I need, we need some clothing to give to these people that don't have the clothing. That's laying down your life. You will lay down your life. Not your neck, not your neck, not your neck, but your life. Will you lay something down? I, I think, you know, once in a while, instead of, you know, we contribute money for this, contribute money for this, I think we can say, you know, one Sunday, that today, after you give me your normal offering today, we're going to collect offering for those students who don't have anybody to pay their school fees. 
And then we're not going to run over it. You know, just uh, be in a hurry. We we'll say, now put your hand in your pocket and find something juicy and something good and something big and put here. And we're going to spend every penny there for the school fees of those, our children, that don't have anybody to pay school fees. Isn't that a good time? Can we do that? Can we set one Sunday apart and do that? That's a practical love Jesus was talking about. That we lay down our lives for the brethren. Come and look at verse 17. In verse 17, look at what he's saying here. In 1 John chapter 3, verse, verse 17. But whoso has this world's goods, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him. If when we see the needs of others in the house fellowship, we know them. A woman, a sister is a Joseph, you know, put to bed. And they do not have enough to take care of the child. If we have the world's goods, we have the baby materials there, and we're not willing to give those baby materials, I love God, I love God, how dwelleth the love of God in him? A child that just gone to school, and the textbooks say that child needs, your children have used the uh, textbooks, and they're not going to use those textbooks anymore. They're just there in the house. Can't we bring them out and give them to those who are now reading in that same class. That's what he's saying. Anyone that has this world's goods, the material things of this world, and he shares his brother and his sister have need, and he shutteth up the barrels of compassion, how dwelleth the love of God in him. The love of God will be in me. Yeah. I'll do something this week to show that that new kind of love is flowing. Yeah. Am I talking to somebody there? Yeah. Somebody who will do something. Don't pretend that you are writing. I want to see your hand up. You will do something. Yeah. I said you will do something. Yeah. And God will bless every one of you in Jesus' name. Yeah. Look at verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. That's what the Lord is telling us. Let the love be practical. Let the, love, let the love be tangible. Let the love be quantifiable. Something we can see and we'll say, this is love. I already see the mark of that love in our church here. We'll see more of it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at First John chapter 4. First John chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. There's no discrimination in God giving out his salvation. Anybody that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then he says, this is how we see the manifestation of the love of God. Because Jesus Christ was saved for the salvation of humanity. And when you came, he didn't say, ah, that's idol worshiper, you'll not be saved. Ah, that's a black man, you'll not be saved. Ah, that's an illiterate woman, you'll not be saved. Whosoever, as we came, he saved us. And that's why we're here today. He has beautified our lives. And he wants us to stretch out that same mercy and throw out that lifeline of love to other people so that what we have got, they will get as well in Jesus' name. Look at verse 10. Verse 10, here in his love. Not that we loved God. God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, the covering for our sins. And now he tells us in verse 20 of that same chapter 4, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? You see, there are people, look up here for a moment, uh, maybe uh, those who listen to the radio, even some people that watch uh, television. There is um, a preacher in America, 
And that preacher comes and he, he demonstrates, says, we need this, we need this. I need to build a station, I need to build this, I need to build uh, that. And then he's asking for offering. You know, there's some people here in our country, Nigeria, they will send hard and money. They'll send to America. The, in a poor country, they will be sending their money to an evangelist over the television over there, and then they belong to the church here. And we talk about we need to build uh, this building, we need to build this building. They will, their hands will be in their pocket, it will never come out. And then we we'll wonder, you think we'll say, Look at these stingy people. How are they, how are they not giving? They have given a quality offering to the people, to the radio preacher and to the television preacher. And when it comes to their own church, where they are feeding, they have nothing. That's why it's saying, don't let us do like this. Leave the other people to feed themselves. Leave the rich countries to spend their own money. But over here, we need a bigger church here. Am I talking to you people? Because, you know, I want to come back and have a big Lagos Island white crusade. That whether rainy season or dry season, when knock down that wall, knock down that wall, buy that land there, buy that land there, and then have all the galleries there, and, and the money, the money you are sending to America, sending to Japan, and sending to Hong Kong. And, uh, you know, you contribute a large amount of money. You travel to Israel, you contribute money there. I'll stop all that now. Come and contribute it here. Because this is the place. We need the money here. And we need the building here. Can, should I come back? Of course, of course. And then we're going to show that little practical love, not theoretical love practical law and then don't uh, if you want to give the offering don't go and change the pound sterling to naira uh, look at you um, and then you go to change the dollar to naira you go to change the euro to naira and then you bring uh, one thousand keep your naira bring that sterling currency and then because that is what will do the job i said it will do the job you look like people that will obey god you look like people that will love one another. And we're going to have a big church here in Jesus' name. And that's why it says, look at that chapter 4 verse 20 again. Chapter 4 verse 20. It says in verse 20, if a man say, I love God, I love God, I love God, and hateth his brother, is a liar. I will not be a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? This and this commandment have we from him that he who loveth God. Are those people here today? I said, are they here today? He who loveth God love his brother also. Let's love one another. And this love will not be a kind of cold love, stingy love that you cannot even tell whether it's there or not. Look at First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 22. First Peter chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love, or pretending love, of the brethren, see that she love one another with a pure heart. How? Fervently, fervently, that we'll be able to see that love and discover that love in every one of our hearts and lives in Jesus' name. In First John chapter 3, he's telling us how practical the love should be. He's telling us how tangible that love should seem. My little children, let us not love in words, that's in word only, neither in tongue only, but in deed and in truth. We'll come to point number three now, devotional moments of trusting supplication before God. Devotional moments of trusting supplication before the Lord. We pray 
and, and because we want our prayers to be answered, that's why I want to obey the word of God. The word of God that shows that the love of God is flowing through us. Look at verse 19. Hereby know we that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knoweth all things. Look up, brothers and sisters. He's talking about love. And then he has already spoken about how practical the love should be. And then John, the beloved, saying, brothers and sisters, we're talking about love. We can feel the love. We can sense the love. When love touches your heart, you will know that that is love. And when love is withdrawn, you will know. Even a little child will know when the mother withdraws her love. And the wife will know when the husband withdraws his love. And the husband will know when the wife withdraws the love. You may still smile, but your wife can tell that, you know, my husband, did I do something wrong? Did I say something wrong? Is something wrong somewhere? Because we can tell. We recognize love when we see it. That's why it says, if our hearts condemn us, that God is greater. What it means is this. I see my brother there. My brother sees me coming. He's all happy and excited and he's expecting, I'm going to say good morning, how are you? I'm going to say good afternoon, how are you? And I'm going to be with joy because it's my delight to see my brother. But I just passed by and my brother is wondering, something is wrong somewhere. How could my brother pass like that? There's no good morning, there's nothing. Just leave me here, see if I'm a non-entity, a non-entity. I see if I don't exist. And your conscience will tell. And it says, if our hearts condemn us, God is greater. If your heart is saying, brother, this is not right. Sister, this is not right. Look at how you behave to that person. How you acted to that person. That person has feeling. That person is going to be hurt. This is not demonstration of love. You snub somebody. You overlook somebody. You degraded somebody. You looked at him like this and belittled him. And the fellow feels it to the marrow of the heart. And he's saying, your heart is telling you that this is wrong. Don't rush to the prayer meeting and say, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, your heart is telling you, in Jesus' name, this one will not get to heaven. If our heart condemn us, God is greater. And God is, all that God is asking for is that you come back and say, my brother, I'm sorry. The way I went, that fellow may say, oh, I don't mind. Don't worry. You mind? So just saying that that's bold face. Have you heard of people like that? I don't mind. I don't mind. That's all right. I know you have a lot of things to do. I know you are busy. I know you are going your way. Don't, don't mind that. Just stay there and say, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How are you? And then spend quality time and erase all that from the heart. That's what you're saying. If our heart condemn us, God is greater. And when you do that, God will say, that's a true child of mine. That's a true lead. That's a true daughter of mine. Because you rectify that thing. Don't allow that thing to stay for one week and one month and one year. And then after one year, you are now coming back and saying, uh, brother, there was one day, 1999, that uh, we were passing like this, and that fellow said, ah, so you remember, so you know. Although it is 1999, I remember myself. It was very vivid. Okay, I come to apologize now. Well, better late than never. Welcome. I appreciate that you have come, but don't let it wait for so many years. Let us do it today. I say, let us do it today. Yeah. Ah, the church is now quiet. We will do it. And the new kind of love will flow in Jesus' name. And then once we settle that with the Lord, we go to pray. I'm telling you, supernatural things will begin to happen in your life. 
And before you even mention what you need, the Lord will do everything in Jesus' name. Uh, well, let's, let's go on now. We're looking in at verse 21. My, my beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. If our heart condemn us not, as we relate to each other, as we be a blessing to each other, as we interact with each other, it says, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God and whatsoever. Everybody say, whatsoever. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. He will answer your prayer. Amen. And this is his commandment that we, love, that we should believe on the name of the son, of his son Jesus Christ and love one another. So many times it's repeating this love one another, love one another. It must be very important to repeat something like this over and over. As he gave us commandments, he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him, and hereby we know that we are, that he abideth in us by the spirit which he has given us. And uh, the Lord will remember your labor of love. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. And we're reading from verse 10. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. Labor of love. You see there are many kinds of labor. There is a duty. There is responsibility. Uh, if I don't do it, they'll say I'm backsliding. If I don't, uh, you know, attend that uh, area of work, they'll say, where did you go? Where were you not there? So, okay, let me go there. It's like uh, compulsion. But it says, no, this one, the one that God will not forget is the labor of love. How do you know that somebody is having a labor of love? Or oh, everybody can tell. Look at that little child. Somebody comes to visit our family. And then the little child, the little baby is just about two years of age. And that uh, little baby, uh, this person that comes wants to carry the baby. And the baby looks at the face. The baby can tell whether... He wants to do this to just please my parents. To just say that, you know, I carried your baby. So I'm asking for this. Can you do it for me? But the baby can tell when you are all, when you are happy. You are rejoicing. You love this baby. The baby can tell this is a labor of love. The same thing. When you do things for people, they can tell whether it's just duty whether you are just doing it because you have to do it or whether there is joy in your heart i am happy to be of service to you i am happy to be of a usefulness advantage to you people can tell that's the reason when we come to serve the lord and serve the people of god come with your heart come with affection and come with love and come with all the joy you have in your heart that the lord will say this is the labor of love it will be rewarded in jesus name See, that, that's why many people do not, they say, I, I sowed this seed and I was expecting the fruit. I can't see any fruit because it says he loveth a cheerful giver. You see, when they are making the announcement now, we're going to give our offering and all that. Uh -huh, they have, they have, we do have to do this every Monday. Do we have to do this every, every Sunday? Do we have to do this every Thursday? Okay. Let them uh, do it and then they bring, um, you know, the bag and the person there is opening his eyes. The person there is opening her eyes and then you look at them, they're looking at you. It's okay. So they don't say that I didn't put something there. One, uh, one note that is dirty and almost torn that the bread seller will not get it from your hand. That she's okay, you get this and then you put it there. Labor of love. Tell me the labor of love you are excited the best you have you want to give your best to the lord and heaven will give you the very best in jesus name 
So let's always remember you are preaching labor of love. You are singing like a wonderful song tonight, labor of love. You are doing anything else, Shreen, labor of love. You are leading the house fellowship, labor of love. You are not fighting with them in the house fellowship. The house fellowship is there to demonstrate love. And then the people can tell. And anybody, anytime you travel out of town that you are not around, your house fellowship will say, Where's uh, sister so and so? Where's brother so and so? And when you come back after two weeks, you have gone. They say, Welcome. You were not here last uh, Sunday. We missed you a lot. That person has been having the labor of love. I pray that what you render to the Lord in your service will be the labor of love in Jesus' name. And then it says, God is not unrighteous to forget your labor, your work, and your labor of love, which he have, which he have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. I pray that we'll continue to do it in Jesus' name. And let's come to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I'm reading here from verse 12 and verse 13. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. We're reading from verse 12 and verse 13. It says in verse 12, this is my commandment. Is it past tense? Is it past tense? What is it? Present tense. This is for you. This is for today. This is my commandment that she love one another as I have loved you. That she love one another as I have loved you. Verse 13. Greater love has no man than this than that a man lay down his life for his friends. What are you going to lay down? Just to tell somebody, I love you with the love of Christ, fervently from within my heart. Maybe you need to lay an opinion down. Because once you hold that opinion, I'm right, she is wrong. I'm right, he is wrong. That's what he always does. Somebody must teach him lesson. Somebody must teach her lesson. If I don't take my stand, she will not know that she is wrong and I'm right. You need to lay that thing down. The other time, look at what she did and look at what he did. You need to lay that one down. Because if you don't lay those things down, you'll not be able to love one another. But thank God, you lay it down. Yeah. You see, those things you are carrying, and let me tell you like this. Somebody has a bag at the back hung upon his neck. When that person was born, there's nothing in the bag. Somebody commits an offense, a little pebble, throw it in that bag. Another offense, unforgiveness, slander, criticism, whatever, that's another pebble, you put it in that bag. And then another offense again, he did that, I'm angry, I'm angry. Somebody should not do that to a human. How could he do that to me? That's another pebble, you put it in that bag. You know, that bag will weigh you down. The people who commit all those offenses and they put those pebbles in the bag, they've gone. They're living their lives and they're free. They're happy. They're joyful. And they're, they're making progress. But the pebbles in that bag at your back will be so heavy now. You remember brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, child so-and-so, lady so-and-so, madam so-and-so. All those things are like pebbles, like a heavy bag. But tonight, remove that bag. Lay that bag down. Your mind will be free. Your heart will be free. Your life will be free. You cannot run the race with that bag at your back. But when you lay it down and say, from today, I will love. From today, I will love. You will make progress. I said you will make progress. And then you look for somebody. There's somebody there. Somebody there. Somebody there. You made up your mind. I'm a Christian. She's a Christian. I'll go my way. She goes her way. After the Bible study tonight, go and find him out. Go and find her out and say it is all over. 
I said it is all over. Find out somebody there that will have said nothing again. No interaction again. I say tonight, let me see. Why are you, somebody dodging there? Let me see your face. I say tonight, lay that back down. Let us make progress. You will make progress. The love of God in you will flow in Jesus' name. Rise up and tell the Lord, I will. Yes, Lord, I will. Yes, Lord, I will. Yes, Lord, I will. This is a new day. This is a new era. And it is a period, it is a moment of new love. Don't say, I hate the voice of that person. Lay that down. I hate the look of that person. Lay that down. I hate the attitude of that person. Lay that down. I hate the language of that person. Lay that down. Love one another. This is the message that God has given us, that Christ has given us, that ye have love one towards each other.